Let's pray. <coughs> Lord, we are your church. We are a small microcosm of the greater church. But whether small or large, we are nothing without you. You show us what love is. You encourage us how to love one another. Help us not only to know, but to do so. And to find it so easy. Because you provide that wonderful path and a wonderful example. In Christ's name, amen. When we talk about the church, oh, let, let's just get, before we go there, when looking at uh, trying to plan the sermons for the few weeks, I mean, up to Easter, you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You got a pattern. Mm -hmm. Then you know you got Mother's Day and graduation, which this year happens to be the same day. Then you got Memorial Day and then there's the, the Sunday celebrated training. So there's a lot of days to fill it. What are we going to do for today? There's a family <coughs> picnic today. Family, that is a good topic. Yeah. And so we're looking at the church and the church specifically as a family. But when you look at the church and scripture, there are many metaphors which God has given us through his disciples to describe the church. In Matthew 5, we are called the salt of the earth. Mm -hmm. In that same chapter, we are also called the light to the world, showing the path to Christ. In 1 Corinthians, we're referred to as the body of Christ, and he is the head. In Ephesians, we are soldiers in an army of God. In 1 Corinthians and 1 Peter, we are the temple of the living God. Then back in Ephesians, men, this one may be a little more hard for you. Have you ever considered yourself a bride? But you are men and women. The church we are the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. But all of these, while they're wonderful and give us understanding of who we are in Christ and our relationship with the Father, one, well, these are still hampered because with a metaphor it means it's like or as, but not quite there. It's similar, but there's a little bit different. But one term which is used is more than a metaphor. It's reality. That's family. We are a family. It is the truth. But what is family? Well, let's go to the experts. At least so-called experts. Uh, sociologists, I mean, they look at society and how things are broken down into groups. How would they define a family? Well, they say a socially recognized group, usually joined by blood, marriage, cohabitation, or adoption, that forms an emotional connection among its members and that serves as an economic unit of society. Yeah, I know you're going to go home and memorize that one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a part of an economic unit with a, a recognized group. Yeah, that, that's my family. But there are things in here which so speaks true to the church. First of all, we are a socially recognized group. The world knows who we are. It's our group against us. We are joined by, well, some of us might be joined by blood, some might be by marriage. And, but we're all by adoption. Jesus Christ Adopt us. We're brothers and sisters. <coughs> Forming an emotional connection. True, there are some out churches out there which maybe have distant relationships because they're there for Sunday morning, but they hardly see each other throughout the rest of the week. But I'm glad to say our church is one 
when we are united. We have ties. When one hurts, everyone hurts. And if, if we're not hurting, we're there applying the bandage. And we're an economic unit of society. Basically, we're contributing to our society. You are doing that. So by sociological standards, you hit the definition on the head. But everyone has their own definition, so let's go to what Webster says. He says, the basic unit in society, traditionally consisting of two parents rearing their children. Also, that has been expanded because of the different types of families out there. Does that really fit us? Well, we have a single parent. His name is God. We have a big brother stepping in, and we're all the children. So, in that sense, yes, we still fit Webster's definition. But Webster had like five or six definitions. We'll just take a look at a few others. A group of individuals living under one roof, and usually under one head. Under one roof, we, well, we're an extended family. But we have one head, God the Father, through Jesus Christ. A group of people of common ancestry. Well, we could go all the way back to Adam, but we have, how about the, the blood of Jesus Christ? A group of people, uh, people's regard as driving from a common stock. That's where we get our Norwegians that we are talking about earlier. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would say we have the stock of Christ. Um, and a group of people united by certain convictions or common affiliation. Yes, our beliefs in who Jesus is and what he means to us. So these are very good definitions. But they're just words. It defines, but lacks the content. The church is a family by meeting, yes, all those qualifications which we saw listed, but we are with so much more because while God did create the whole world, he allowed us to call him dad. To call him Abba, Father. I'm still young in Christ. Yes, I'm about 40 some years in Christ. But I haven't got that familiarity yet because I remember in seminary praying with an individual and they'd go, Daddy! I'm going, whoa. <laughs> I don't mind calling him Father or Lord. Daddy is a little too familiar for me. <laughs> Give him a little respect. But they are. It's just something which I wasn't used to. <clears throat> but we do have that understanding of who he is and that we can call him dad, father. And then we can literally have a relationship with Jesus Christ, not as just our teacher or our savior, but big brother. He is the firstborn of all creation. He is the first of the resurrected. And he's calling us no longer his servants or even just friends brothers and sisters. He has brought us into the family. So, but that's nice to know about my relationship. <clears throat> but he goes one step further. He goes, it's not just you as an individual related to the Father and to the Son, but to each other. Just like Sonia is related to God the Father and God the Son. So is Keith. So am I. And because we're all united under that one ancestry or one lineage, I can definitely say, how you doing, sister? How you doing, brother? I love you because we're in the same family. I got your back because I know you got mine. And when you look at the church history, we also just recognize, which I somewhat just leaned on a little bit, but those terms, when Jesus was here on earth, before he went to the cross, he referred to the twelve as his disciples, his followers. But by the, before he went to the cross, he started calling them friends. But then, 
after the crucifixion and the resurrection and Pentecost. They became brothers and sisters. We see that the family language. We still honor Jesus as Savior, Lord, God. But we have become quite familiar with him. And this type of language of being brothers and sisters has dominated church history from that time forward. But how do we keep this identity going? Do we just, every Sunday morning, How you doing, Brother Keith? Mm -hmm. Sister Karen, good to see you. Some church traditions do carry on that. But when you see your kids, Hey, son Joe, how you doing today? Joe knows who that is, and we don't need to remind him. <laughs> but it's that sense of trying to find out how do we keep this identity alive. I mean, there are other organizations out there which use the term brother or sister. How about unions and lodges and clubs? When I was thinking that, the first thing that went to my mind, going back to the Flintstones and the Water Buffalo Lodge. <laughs> Brother Water Buffalo, Barney, how you doing? That's a long way. But what happens once they get outside of their meetings? That terminology stopped the relationships. But when they were in their lodge meetings, that's when the brotherhood existed. The church doesn't quit being brothers and sisters once we leave this building. Amen. It keeps going. We still see maybe a little more than what the unions and lodges do when you have fraternities and sororities. Your sisters are brothers for life. Especially when you get together on those reunions. But for the most part, once you graduate, unless you have some maybe one or two close friends in those fraternities or sororities, the ties wane. <coughs> Not the church. The church is as strong. It keeps going. But what keeps that family identity going? What is the basis is it simply because we meet together every Sunday? No. It's not because of our meeting. It's not because we've all agreed to a certain doctrine or a creed or a uh, not emotional, denominational ties. No. It's not about statements. It's all about well, well, another thing which is not, it's also not tied to geographical or social boundaries. As long as you meet these particular circumstances, you're part of the family. There's only one requirement. Do you know Jesus? Mm -hmm. And when I say no, I mean not know about him, but do you know him personally? Mm -hmm. That doesn't. What's that relationship? If you know him like he wants you to know him, you're part of the family. You then have that relationship with the Father, you have that relationship to the Son, and therefore you have a relationship with each other. We cannot think of church as simply a Bible study, a gathering, and an entertainment hour, a religious organization. Or a 501c3, which we can donate to. It's a family with God as the head. You are part of that family. But how do we live this family life out? Well, I think, see. Yeah, I got 22 points for the next point. So. Rodney, go slow on cooking out there. <clears throat> but the points are all the one another verses in the New Testament. 
all the commands given by Christ, Peter, Paul, and John that he, they tell the church to do one to one another. I will go quickly, so these will be very quick, but if you would like more information about them, I will gladly bestow upon them. First of all, <clears throat> love one another. If you don't get any other one another, make sure you get that. Because all others derive from that. Love one another. Not just simply like, or if you're used to Facebook, follow. No. Love them. Be devoted to one another. Devoted. That's a little deeper there. That means investing in. Honoring each other. Are you listening to what they're saying? Giving them time of day. Or are you merely loving them from a distance? That's not love. Do good to each other. Inspire each other in the faith. Not just help, but inspire. Live in harmony with each other. Mm. We like the ideal, but sometimes we wonder how. Because we all have our own different thoughts. That doesn't mean, okay, we all now agree 100% on everything. No. But we agree to disagree. And we honor one another. We remove obstacles for each other. Not only if I see a cup on the floor and I see Rick and Ray step on it, I can hurry up and run that. That's one way of removing an obstacle, but spiritual obstacles as well. If I spend too much time maybe watching TV, Karen has all the right to go in and shut it off. Because it's an obstacle for me doing my work, which God has called me to do. We're there for each other. Trying to encourage and remove temptations when possible. We accept one another as well as we instruct one another. And this next one I will say, I'm abbreviating it. It's actually mentioned like uh, five or six different times by the different authors. It's greet one another. It goes on with a holy kiss. Yeah. <laughs> I'll leave that part up to you. <laughs> well, better make sure the other person is well. <laughs> but make sure you don't ignore the other people. <laughs> Greet one another. Show them that you are into their life. You're interested. That you acknowledge them. You encourage one another. And you're of one mind and live in peace with one another. You some humbly serve one another in love. Yes, we must even bear with one another. Be kind, compassionate, and forgive each other. And another one which uh, is not for everyone, especially not for me and Rodney. <laughs> Speak to another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. <laughs> that won't be an encouragement to you if I start singing to you. <laughs> I might recite a song to you. Maybe a source of encouragement. But take the word of God back as a source of encouragement. Submit to one another. Ooh, that one we had problems with. We know the answers. No, we don't. We just know who the answer is. We teach and admonish one another. 
and spur one another on to love and do good deeds. Be sympathetic with one another. Offer hospitality to one another. Have fellowship. Yeah, try to have a relationship if you're not even fellowshipping with each other. Come on now. Spend time with each other. <clears throat> One which I was said earlier, and I, I like how Paul wrote it. Um, Because he recognized the family dynamics. The wording in the NIV was outdo one another in good works. Mm -hmm. He knows family competition. <laughs> but you also notice the love in it. He didn't say beat them up in doing or smoke them. No, just outdo them. Love is there. Challenge each other. Inspire one another. To say that we are a church family implies the significant spiritual bond between believers and the way we walk with one another through life, encouraging, supporting, and loving each other. Now, are we the perfect family? No, we're human. God may be perfect, and he's trying to make, bring perfection about us, but we're still a dysfunctional family. There's a thing called sin still working among us. But we go to the Father. We listen to the Spirit, and thank goodness for the forgiveness of the Son that we can still come together to build one another up. But what happens when we fail to see that family dynamic truly living out in our church? How do we take steps to bridge that gulf that separates what God has called us to as a family instead of trying to live out the church as an organization? All I can say is go back to Mark 3. What did Jesus say? Was the individuals who were considered his family. In case you forgot, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the God's will is my brother and sister. Does God's will. Well, what is the will of God? That's the big question. And it isn't like God's hiding it from us. He told us plainly, what are the two greatest commandments? To love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. So start there. Do we think we can ever truly do that in this side of heaven? No. But can I do it better than yesterday? Yes. But then don't only really worry about my relationship with the Father. Worry and do all I can to follow the second commandment. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Now there might be a small step before you start really loving your neighbor. Because if you don't really love yourself, it's going to be hard to love your neighbor. So, spend maybe a little time, if you need to, finding out how much God loves you, where you're at. So you can feel good about yourself, so therefore you can love your neighbor in the same mind. Then love him. Those were the two commandments. And Jesus did add a new commandment, and it wasn't different from the other. It says, love each other. Simple, direct. Not if you hit points A, B, and C. Then love one another. No, just simply love one another. And he, like, he gave, he inspired those disciples to give us ways to do that. But you say, I may not feel like loving my brother and sister today. I just want to stay in bed. 
the world's bad, the family's all right, but I don't want to deal with all that emotional dynamic. I just want to stay in bed. Love. Go out and love. Not by your emotion, but by your action. Because you do care. And as you do invest in them, and spurring one another on, encouraging, helping, submitting, doing good works for one another, you will find that love. It's like the, 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 taking place in your heart, like it did for a branch. It grew, it grew, it grew. If you remember that Christmas story. I know it's a fictional one, but it's true for us. If we do the work with a loving attitude, the feeling of love will come back and bless us just as much as we are blessing Family means putting the other first. We're looking out for each other. We're loving, encouraging, being there 24-7. Are we doing that? I know we are. But I know we can do better. And one way we can practice is getting to know each other better during our picnic time. Sit down with someone who you haven't talked to in a while. Find out what's going on. Pray with them. Hug them. Help clean up afterwards. Dad love that. <laughs> or if you can't love some people over Mission Village, show the love of Christ that you have found here through people of Mission Village. They want to know it too. They're part of our extended family. That's family. That's our church. Yes, we have a creed, a mission statement. But anybody can have those. But only the church can have the love of Christ. Don't hoard it. Share it and watch it grow. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to come before you and just thank you for this whole thing called family. It helps give us our identity. It helps us become stronger in our relationship with you. Without each other, we are nothing. Help us, dear Lord, to not only that we think about family as what it can do for us, but what we can do for each other. To follow all of those one unto another verses so that we can live out your decree of love. In all this we pray. Amen.